This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. For those of you that are just joining us, my name is Laura Castaneda. I'm going to be moderating our panelists and, and uh, moving the panel along. These global captains of industry will discuss how strategic philanthropic practices can be an instrument of change and development in Mexico. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. First, Manuel Arango, a celebrated businessman and philanthropist, founder of Grupo Cifra, and founder of the Mexican Center for Philanthropy. To his left, Edminio Blanco, the president and CEO of Strategic Solutions and chairman of ICOM. And Roberto Servije, CEO of Bimbo Bakeries, the world's largest producer of baked goods. We also have a university connection here, Andrea Castillo, who is an alumna, Elliot Pepper and Lila Peterson, who are current students of the International Relations and Pacific Studies, are going to be presenting their uh, sustainability innovation growth insight access. So this is the way we'll work our panel. Um, the three of you might want to come up here. <laughs> The student group will, will uh, tell you about their project first, and then each of the panelists will come up and present, and then we'll engage in some question and answer. Well, good evening, or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Andrea, and I'm here with my colleagues Elliot and Lila, and together we are Inside Access. Um, as we were told earlier, I am a recent alumna of IRPS. I graduated in 2009. And both Lila and Elliot are second years, and they're current students at the program. So about 10 months ago, we got together, and we were trying to figure out a way to make our communities more sustainable. We were driven uh, by the innovations that we saw in our day-to-day -day lives, and we were very passionate about this goal. So we started this company, it's a private company, and we also partnered up with a very young company in Mexico, specifically in Mexico City, um, that's also young entrepreneurs, and together we are making our communities more sustainable through the very innovations that drove our passion in the beginning. Our goal at Inside Access is to bring clean technology to the world. We do this with three services. The first one is consulting. We work with clean technology companies from all over the world, from Switzerland to Australia to Canada. And we bring their products to Latin America. But we do this specifically in four markets, in Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, and the Dominican Republic. We also work on sustainability management. We offer these services to local organizations and companies so that they can either start a sustainability program or improve the one they already have. And once we get there, we use marketing to promote their message locally in California and throughout the world. But we're not really here to talk to you about these services today. What we're really here to talk to you today is about our Corporate Social Responsibility Program, also known as CSR, and Lila will tell you all about it. Well, Lights. first I want to ask you all a question. I don't know if you have ever been in a blackout. Yes? Okay. <laughs> Especially if you live in Mexico City, it's horrible. The football game you were watching suddenly stops. The Facebook conversation you were having, you cannot able, you're not able to continue it. Um, the paper you were just about to finish is gone. <laughs> it's totally gone. And, <laughs> and then you start being bored. And then you realize how important it is light in your life, in every, every day of your life. And then you turn around and you see that 2.49% of the Mexicans live without this basic service. Uh, this is almost 3 million people. 
It's close to San Diego County's population that doesn't have access to light. What they do is they use other sources of energy, such as candles, such as biomasses and diesel. And another big problem is that it also hinders the development of all these Mexicans because kids are not able to do their homeworks. The adults are not able to keep continue their work during the night. And that's why we decided to join this joint venture with these Mexican technology developers uh, who has, they have these solar panels. It's a lighting system and it's sustainable, it's long lasting, it's healthy and it's not polluting. And it's bringing light to all of those who live in the dark. Yeah. So can we have the lights back up, please? Yeah, <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> so that's, that's actually what brought us to El Barril. And El Barril is a tiny fishing village. It's on the Sea of Cortez, right on the border between Baja Norte and Baja Sur. There are about 25 households there. And El Barril is completely off the grid. There's no access to electricity, and so the local community has to use diesel for generation if, if they want to have any power. And diesel, as Lila mentioned, is not only expensive, but it's also highly polluting and noisy. <laughs> and so we partnered with a student-led NGO called the Baja Project, based here at IRPS, to deploy these technologies for solar rural electrification to El Barrio. And last November, uh, in partnership with the Baja Project, we deployed a pilot project there of three systems for three different households. And um, I'm really excited to announce that right now that I just found out two days ago that we had such positive response from the community uh, that every single household in, in, the, in the town wants one of these systems and we'll be deploying the full scale project this March. So we're really excited about that and we're very pleased to share it with you here today. These systems are specifically designed for rural electrification, so they're very simple. Um, we actually train local people to install and maintain them 100%, um, and uh, they require very little maintenance over their entire useful life, so they last for years and years and years. Uh, we also make sure that every single project we do includes community buy-in. So in this case, El Barrio, the community of El Barrio, paid for 20% of the entire cost of the project, and 80% of the cost of the project was subsidized. We are currently developing larger scale projects throughout, especially northern Mexico in the, in the border region, and specifically in Baja Norte and Tecate, with communities ranging in size up to 80,000 people. But we need new sources of financing in order to deliver this technology to those communities. So we would invite all of you philanthropists, artists, scientists, <laughs> and leaders in the audience today uh, to participate with us in empowering and powering these new communities. Uh, so that's how we at Insight Access are moving Mexico forward. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Manuel? I mean, invite the panelists back up and Manuel to the podium. Uh, you know, when I was invited to, to be here with you, I was uh, very happy to, to come and to talk about Mexico, outside of Mexico. Uh, until I read the, the Ten Commandments of TED Talks. I had not read that before. And uh, that worried me because he said, don't steal the time of the, the other speakers. And uh, that's pretty difficult to do, but I'll try. And uh, also, they said, you know, that uh, your presentation must be exact to the time. Uh, I know you will give me a fair warning. Uh, it's very difficult, really, after having listened to all the previous panelists, many of them very close and respected friends, it's very difficult to follow, to follow the act. But at least there is something very positive about it. What is very positive about it is that they have covered environment, they have covered culture, from the beginning of times to the present. Uh, also, uh, Eduardo, you 
you help me very much because with your graphs, which I had in my mind, I don't have PowerPoint, uh, with your graphs, you, move, you, you show that Mexico is definitely moving forward. Sometimes Mexicans, we complain whether we're going backwards or this, but when you see numbers and when you compare to other countries of the world, you realize what Mexico has achieved in the last 50 years or in the last 100 years. And yes, we're moving forward, but as you very well said, not at the pace that we could have moved, unfortunately. So we have many things that we have to fix. I wrote the brief paper, I don't write, uh, uh, that's not my, I'm not uh, given that, that beautiful science of being able to write a good paper, but I decided to write a good paper because I was desperate about everything that I read in Mexico and outside of Mexico, and I wrote it, not for the newspaper, I wrote it and somebody put it in the internet and then finally the Mexican newspaper published it. I don't want to talk about the paper, it's uh, there if somebody's interested, I can tell you how to link to the paper. It's a piece of paper in which I talk about all the things which are wrong in Mexico. Very many, from corruption to, uh, I will not go the list. It's there, that's the, best, the first paragraph. And then the rest of the paper was talking about, yes, but this is not Mexico. This is a part of Mexico, unfortunately, is a minority. Very impacting, yes, very impacting. And, and we know you have seen the news and it's very impacting. But I don't know if it's 80% or 90% of Mexicans or the Mexicans, I said, that get up every day, they go to work, they take children to school, they try to have a good family, they struggle, and they go through everything, political storms and natural storms and everything else. And this is what I have seen in more than seven decades of uh, my life. I have seen, I have, you know, in my, in my case, I have seen so many crises in Mexico, expropriation of banking, banks, and this is the end of Mexico, and economy up and down. Through the eyes of my father, that lived to be 100 years, you know, he arrived in Mexico from a different culture, and uh, he went through the revolution, the oil expropriation, and he always kept telling us, why are you complaining? This is a fantastic country. This country is achieving wonderful things. He had a few deceptions at the end, but anyway, we follow that, and, uh, and I have a lot of doubts, of course, like everybody does sometimes, but I have, I have the, the credibility that, that Mexico will continue because of those strong cultural roots and because most of the people, some foreigners have told me, sometimes you forget your biggest asset, and what's our biggest asset, and see you have wonderful people. It's true, if properly trained, if properly educated. Rafael Tovar spoke about education, how important it is, we all agree. In philanthropy, most of the money goes to education and health. But for me, there is something before education and health. And of course, it's related to, to education, which is the rule of law. And in Mexico, we have to do a lot of work. They said there are two things that move humanity. One is love and the other one is fear. We have to have respect for the law. And the one that doesn't obey the law and is within the rule of law has to be punished for it. And it has to be very clear. And that takes care of a lot of things, of corruption, of many, many other things. Let me get to the subject of philanthropy. I, I don't like to be presented as a philanthropist. I think it's very pretentious. And I remember, I think it was John Steinbeck that once said that a philanthropist is somebody that has a bald head and age and all sorts of things, which has trained himself to smile what is, while his conscience picks his pocket. <laughs> so with that definition, I said, please say something else. But, but let me say something. Uh, what I understand for philanthropy is not money. I think money is always important. We all need money to do things. I think the most important thing in philanthropy is when you are willing to share the most precious things that we have in life, which is time. When you share your time, when you share your talent, when you share your work, that's the real philanthropy. Uh, sometimes uh, I call, you know, people know that I ask for money, so sometimes I call and, and they say, well, don't come, just tell me how much, what is the check for? <laughs> I said, I want to talk to you about something else. Imagine the corporations, the individuals, and everybody willing to share part of their time. One hour a week is the standard that we have in the Mexican Center for Philanthropy. If 20% of the population, 10% of the population gave one hour a week of their work, their talent, their handwork, whatever, whatever they have, everybody has something to give. Imagine the impact that that would be. We have no statistics in Mexico in that respect, but I know the statistics in the United States. You're talking about a, a working force of 7 million Americans, full-time, not paid, just doing volunteer work. Imagine that talent, not only the hours, the talent which is in there, how that can impact society. 
Uh, I haven't seen any warning there, so that's good. Thank you. But one thing I want to tell you, uh, everything that we have heard today, previous panelists, what we're really talking is about human behavior. I mean, everything is just how, conduct, how we conduct ourselves. That's how the, the environment, that's how everything is going to be impacted. How, what do we do every day when we get up? How do we live? I mean, what do we consume, uh, et cetera? I met this friend that uh, in the days that I met him, he had to travel in the world with the United States passport because the Brazilian, in those days, Brazil has changed a lot. In those days, he was not welcome in the government of Brazil. His name was Miguel Darcy de Oliveira. Now he's a very important figure and very important working with the government next to President Cardoso, and he's almost his right-hand man. And, and he said one thing, he said, what can we, how many options do we have in our lives to work in? And he said, well, for me, it's very easy. He said, I, maybe I, I hope I can remember. He said, it's divided into four sectors. Private affairs for private affairs, that's the market. Public affairs for public affairs, well, that's government or state, whatever you want to call it. Then he said, private affairs for the public good, then you can call it whatever, you can call it uh, volunteer work, you can call it philanthropies, you can call it NGOs, anything. And then he said, and the last one, which I don't recommend, he said it's public, public, uh, public affairs for private, for private benefit, and that's corruption. So let's forget about the last one, <laughs> and let me concentrate on the first three. If we forget about the last one, okay. Uh, public for public, we all know that we need good governments, and that's a very complex subject to talk about, but I mean, Mexico uh, is a democratic country. Uh, we are a kind of dysfunctional democracy, but we are truly a democracy. I mean, we, we are such a democracy that we cannot come to an agreement in anything. Bye, okay. <laughs> well, anyway, those four things, if we just give some of our talent, some of our time, some of that to the rest of society, and we build an equilibrium between government private affairs, market, and citizens. The silent voice of those citizens, which I refer to my article, we have to make that voice heard. They have to participate. They have to assume the responsibilities to create an equilibrium between market forces, government forces, and the citizens, which is what all the countries which have progressed, they have those three basic elements. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Well, when uh, Manuel Weinberg and Eugenio, there you are, and Eugenio Garza called me last week to invite me to participate here, as they say, as a substitute teacher, um, it, I was very uh, nicely surprised that by the fact that this positive trust of this conference, which, by the way, has been excellent. My congratulations to you and to every one of the presenters who have been really a show of excellence from, from Mexico. Um, the, the, f the fact that this is positive coincides with the presentations that I have been doing in the last three months. I mean, I, was, I got tired of saying the, the bad things, and then I started talking about the positive things and with different clients on this. And, and I think that there is a lot of positive things to talk about in Mexico. So today, I will, I will just uh, tell you that um, through the last 20 years, Mexico has been able to build, at the very least, a minimum, robust minimum path of growth through sustained application of policies. So I will, I will talk about that. And then obviously what uh, Manuel very well said is, yes, we, 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 we're growing, we're moving, we need to move faster. And I will uh, be courageous enough to talk a little bit about what we need to do. And uh, also there on the positive side, we are moving. We are doing things, again, given our uh, new democracy, uh, dysfunctional, as you said, uh, not a lot of speed on the changes, but changes never the least. All right, so the first thing is, we have uh, built this uh, interesting growth path based on, on three elements. The first one is uh, population, population control. Uh, 
here you can see that Mexico was growing very fast, and this is sort of a recent, um, recent uh, beginning, but in the 70s we were growing at 3%. So it has come to 1%, 1.25%, which is very interesting. And what that means is that the fertility rate is getting to the point where basically a mother has two kids, yeah, which is just basically substitution. Well, the interesting thing on the economic side is that the dependency rate, that is to say those that don't work divided by the people that work has been decreasing. That's the seed of the middle class. And that in Mexico, we are starting to enjoy that and we will be able to enjoy that for uh, many years to come until the population just stops. So the baby boom comes out and people, uh, uh, as you have less dependency, people have more money to spend, they spend more, and that's an engine of growth, demand, investment, growth. The second one is with respect to macroeconomic stability. As, as you know, Mexico had lived through recurring crises, and those crises are reflected on uh, an the interest rate. Uh, actually, I want to tell you that I bought my first house here, <laughs> Ex exactly there. That's when I went to Mexico and I bought my house. The interest rate was 50, almost 60%. So first of all, you have to have a very good friend in a bank who will trust that at that interest rate, you will be capable of paying, right? Because it implies that you have to pay more than half the, the, the loan the first, first year, all right? Well, and the great thing is every, every, day, every month that you pay, you owe more and more and more and more. Well, that has changed, and it has changed substantially. Now people can buy houses, cars, refrigerators, TVs, okay? Again, a source, interesting source of demand, growth, investment. The third one is uh, probably my preferred subject, uh, NAFTA. So, um, well, still, still is not quite, quite needed. So NAFTA, uh, you, you, we all know the integration is, is, is fabulous, what, what has ha happened. NAFTA is uh, more than 15 years, a, a very great integration. We are trading almost a billion dollars per day. The interesting thing is what's, what's next? Well, what is very interesting is that still the integration between Mexico and the United States is young. What do I mean? I, I do believe that a very large number, very important part of the industrial structure in the United States still is not enjoying the benefits of putting some of the operations in Mexico and facing the competitiveness challenge vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So that's, that's something that will keep on integrating that will mean more investing in Mexico, again, growth. Um, and that is, is, uh, relates to the, the next one. Uh, the, the US uh, corporates and, and everywhere else, they have realized the excellence of Mexican workers. Consumer Reports, this is uh, it's an article that came November 2009. Rates, Fusion, better than Toyota and Honda, and Lincoln MKZ, better than Acura and Lexus. Well, those two cars are manufactured in Hermosillo, all right? So it's, 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 uh, that plant has been steadily producing the best cars in the North American market. So corporates know that investing in Mexico is a good thing because they, they now have, have multiple tests of the quality of Mexican uh, workers. Integration is, is, is moving, and something that is very interesting is uh, this map where our good friend Roberto is a, an important part of the map. This is investment of Mexican corporations in the U.S., and we put here just uh, seven companies. You can see that we are populating not, not only of uh, migrants, 
but also of corporations, Mexican corporations, taking a, a important position. Well, uh, Bimbo is number one in the world now, number one in the US, uh, but many others have been investing. So that this integration is something that is here to stay, I think is going to progress, and this is again growth. So these three things, just to, to keep it short, will give us a very nice rate of growth. There is a doubt in the future, uh, which, which came almost to a certainty in, in, uh, uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, China. China as a competitor of Mexico in this market. Well, in year 2000, China becomes a member of WTO, and as a result, we had um, we, our party in the U.S. market almost finished. As you, as you can see here, in, um, in, in, in year 2000, up to that, we were obviously um, above and superior to China, but then very few years later, just two, three years later, China overpasses. Uh, at the time, I had an interview in CNN, okay, uh, and, and they asked me, uh, well, Mr. Secretary, are you, uh, are you afraid of China? I said, ah, China, I'm not afraid. And I said, well, really? I said, no, I'm in panic. <laughs> I said, I'm in panic. Fortunately, it started changing. It started changing, it dropped, and then it came out. And basically what we lost is everything that is defined as an industrial commodity. Unexpensive footwear, unexpensive apparel, small refrigerator, small TV, all of those we lost everything. But, as, as you can see here, we were uh, really the, 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 the queens or kings of the small refrigerators. We lost the market, okay? But, uh, interesting, and on, on the positive side and positive for growth, is the fact that even if we suffer several years, then it came a, a new wave of industrialization, of things that are intensive in logistic, not small TVs, but big TVs. Not small refrigerators, but big refrigerators. Everything that is, that, uh, for which time to market is important has to be done in Mexico. And then corporations realize that after this first big wave of investment into China, they realize that it's best to diversify risk, that Mexico is a good place to invest. They realize that when they take sophisticated production into China, most probably the, uh, uh, all the secrets will be stolen, and that's not the case in Mexico, for good or for bad, because we, probably because we don't have the capacity to steal them. <laughs> well, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> but then, then they also realized that for inputs which are related to national security, they will never go to China. They go to Mexico and they stay there. So all, all of these plus the fact that wages in China are increasing. Uh, the, you know, before in 2002, the gap was tremendous, 237%, the gap between Mexican salaries and Chinese salaries. Well, you can see now that is 14% and growing. The salaries, this, this, this is, uh, uh, the salaries in China are growing substantially. You, know, you have read about the the uh, increases that they give suddenly 30% or 40% of this. So wages. The other thing that is quite interesting is that in 2000, the price of oil was here, was at 30. Now it's here. Uh, and what you see in these two bars, that's the cost of bringing product from China to the east coast of the United States. This is from Mexico. So the difference is about $5,000 per container, 40 feet container, and then you say, well, what, what about if the container is about $100,000 per container? That is about a 5% implicit tariff if you compare bringing goods from Mexico to bringing goods from China. Again, this tells me that what was happening in 2001 when we started losing everything in the United States, our penetration will stay. Again, growth. So, just to finish before we say bye-bye, say, well, we, uh, as conclusion, we are doing well. We have 
uh, through 20 years establish a minimum path of growth. But uh, it's not enough. If we keep on growing like this, the, the rate of growth average during NAFTA is 3.4. Eliminating the two crises is 3.4. It will take us 33 years to double per capita income. More than a generation. Socially, not acceptable. If we could be able to do some of the things that we have to do, we could grow at 6%. That will imply that in 15 years, half the time, we could see in Mexico doubling of our per capita income. That would give a lot of perspectives to a lot of families. It would be politically highly attractive. So why don't we do it? Well, and what do we have to do? <laughs> what do we have to do? Well, what we have to do is increase labor productivity. Well, this, this is just a reflection of uh, part, part of the history with, with China. You see, on large refrigerators, which are very expensive to bring from China, there, uh, China is, is uh, present here. That's the only thing that China has been able to do, and that's, that's Mexico, we control that. But uh, what do we have to do? We have to increase the productivity of labor. What do we, what do we need? Education, number one, and uh, we need flexibility on the labor law to, to hire and fire, number one. Number two, we need much more investment. Now, although we're receiving about $20 billion a year, we need to double that. We need to eliminate restrictions to investment, which we have a lot. We have restrictions in energy, uh, communications, transport, you name it. They have to be eliminated or substantially reduced. And then government needs to invest more. The Mexican government is not investing for two reasons. It doesn't have money, because we are terrible tax collectors, so we need a tax reform. And number two, given the corruption that existed in the past, the, the laws that apply to public officials that make decisions on, on projects, of investment projects, are terrible. I mean, they basically cannot move. They are scared about doing anything. So that, that has stopped many very interesting projects that will mean growth, that will mean investment and growth in Mexico. And finally, bye-bye, the rule of law that's basic. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I want to thank first Peter Cauhi, Manuel Weinberg, and Alberto for inviting me to this important event. Uh, I also want to express my deepest congratulations to the University of California, San Diego, uh, on its 50th anniversary. Allow me to say that in the few hours that I have been here, I have learned many very, very good things about the university that we did not new, so again, congratulations, keep that good job. Well, I'm, I'm very honored to be invited to discuss with you on two issues that I'm sure that you will find, you will find interesting. Well, to, uh, to start with Mexico, uh, the theme that uh, particularly they asked me to do is to tell about the good things that we have in Mexico. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we all are aware of the host of uh, serious problems that currently plague our country. Uh, media, the national and the international media have taken good care of <laughs> explaining all over the world how the terrible things that are happening there. But if you allow me to speak a little bit on our politics and uh, uh, the history of the 19th and 17th century, I'm sure that uh, we can have a better image of what is going, really going on in Mexico. As you, as you all know, over the past three centuries, Mexico was part of the Spanish colony. In 1910, uh, Miguel Hidalgo the, uh, issued a call for revelation, and we all know Mexico became uh, independent 12 years after a lot of struggles and problems. But it, it, did, it didn't work too well. You know, during the 
first uh, 33 years, the country had 44 governments uh, in existence. <laughs> Later on, we, have a, we had a good president, Porfirio Diaz. He served from 1876 to 1911. He, under Diaz's uh, presidency, Mexico entered the modern age of electricity in the cities. Uh, thousands of miles of uh, railways were built. Factories sprung up. The national debt was paid in full. We were number one in the production of silver. Our GNP was uh, superior to Japan's. Uh, but uh, this progress that lasted for over 30 years uh, awakened other interests that at the end had a very high uh, social cost. Mexican people, the Mexicans, uh, with some help, initiated the revolution in 1910. In the meantime, uh, the rest of the world, with its own problems and opportunities, maintained a sustained growth and modernization. On the other hand, progress and development in Mexico stagnated. After decades of uh, inaction, uh, Mexico experienced a resurgence at the end of the World War II. Uh, exactly on that date is when our bimbo company started, 1945. And from 1945 to 1970, Mexico uh, experienced uh, important economic growth, what you probably heard that was called the Mexican economic miracle. The annual GMP increased during that period uh, was superior to 6%, and we had a very modest 3% annual inflation. Uh, at the beginning of the 1970, the government began a decline. We had a couple of presidents. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh my God. We had high inflation rates currency devaluation, stagnant economy, and that miracle abruptly disappeared. Devaluation and a serious crisis at the end of each six years uh, took place, uh, and uh, those setbacks completely erased all what previously had been achieved. Now, in the year 2000, uh, we had, as you know, for the first time in first time in seven decades, a new political party uh, in the government when President Vicente Fox was elected. Unfortunately, the dialogue between uh, the parties was not effective to implement the policies that Mexico required. Very lately, lately Felipe Calderón, as you know, wo won the election in 2006. Calderón, uh, in my opinion, it's an excellent president. He has worked diligently to reduce unemployment. He's fighting badly against crime and the drug cartels. I have the firm idea that the stagnation that our country has its roots in the squabble that the political parties for power and for wealth and in this, in this environment that Mexicans live, that Mexicans work, and in spite of this, uh, there are possibility, very positive things to dwell upon. And this will bring me to the core of one of the subjects uh, of my conversation with you this afternoon, good things going to Mexico. For many, many years, and I personally experienced that, uh, private business uh, were not connected with the system. We had to be silent, we had to be careful. But nevertheless, uh, many respectable entrepreneurs created important businesses and institutions that reveled and uh, sometimes surpassed the best companies in the, in the rest of the world. In Monterrey, that is an arid and hot, uh, not very hospital region, one of the largest cement companies was created, together with a series of other standing companies like grass production, 
steel, information technologies, banks and beverages. Uh, Mexico still is number one or two in the production of silver. It is also very important uh, in copper, in automobile production, as has been said. Uh, we have important maquiladoras, only second to, to China. They say that one out of nine automobiles that run in the United States are manufactured in Mexico. Mexico also is uh, the most important Latin American country in exports. Mexico has a significant role in the production of uh, vegetables like tomatoes, uh, lettuces, strawberries, mangoes, avocado, broccoli. Just uh, uh, on this broccoli, uh, one company alone exports almost 35% of the broccoli that is consumed in the United States. It's about 1,400,000 1, pieces every day. Uh, as we all know, Brazil is uh, considered a winner among the developing countries, the, the BRIC group, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Indeed, uh, Brazil has done many things right that are increasing their development. Mexico, on the other hand, is considered a, pro a country plagued with problems, mainly due to the violence of the drug mafias. Both, both things are true. But however, let me uh, uh, show you a comparative chart. As you will see, only in the second item, Mexico is not number one. But on the rest, that are important areas uh, like uh, unemployment, uh, homicides, for instance. Mexico is much better, but uh, uh, people doesn't know, doesn't know that. We must uh, recognize that Brazil is doing something positive in the political and the diplomatical areas to sell their image and that Mexico is necessarily not doing that. Nevertheless, with further comparisons, uh, there are many things uh, positive that are, going, uh, that are uh, going for Mexico and I want to mention to you. W we are number one in eolic energy, the, in the growth of eolic, uh, eolic energy. Our international trade has a high level of imports and exports. We are number one in Latin America, and uh, we are growing at double digits in this area. The exchange rate, as has been said, is uh, stable and solid. In the last two and a half years, the peso has gone from 13 to 12 pesos. Today is 12.06, it's a very good rate. <laughs> yeah, Bank, Banco de Mexico International Reserves are at uh, a, its historical maximums. I, I the per capita uh, reserves from Mexico are much more higher than many countries, including the United States. <laughs> the Mexican Stock Exchange Index is at record levels, as you know. Uh, the industrial production uh, after this crisis is running at over 8%. Private investment uh, is recovering very quickly. Foreign investment that is very important, it's in a rising spree. Domestic demand is growing. Last year, 2010, we created almost 720 new jobs and this is certified by the affiliation, affiliation to the Social Security. This is important. We, we know that we need at least one million jobs, but this last year we created 720,000. The World Bank in his uh, report uh, doing business in 2010, in relation to the easiness of doing business, gives Mexico within the Latin American countries and the BRIC economies gives the highest marks. 
in the very important uh, area of health, 92% of the one, 112,000 <laughs> uh, inhabitants have access to medical uh, services, it's not Houston quality service, but medical <laughs> services, and free services, free medicines uh, through different programs uh, that the government has uh, among with the social security. Very important, during the last four years, we have had a dramatic uh, growth in basic infrastructure, roads, airports, seaports, electricity. During this last uh, recent economic crisis that we, we are not over yet, uh, Mexico did not suffer as much as most of the world countries and uh, is recovering very, very quickly. Considering our population as, uh, as families, over 52% of our families are now considered middle class. The, this uh, figure impressed me very much because we, we are considered as a country of poor people. And of course it is true we have a, a large amount of poor, poor people, it's one of our worst problems. But very serious study demonstrated that the Mexican family, 50 something percent of the Mexican families with the uh, income of the two or three different persons in the family, they qualify as middle class. And well, that's, that's important. <laughs> uh, from 1988 to 2008, the per capita income uh, grew 40%. In the last 10 years, uh, this is important, 7 million new houses has, have been built and 98% of them have all the basic services. Today, near 70% of the population have a mobile phone. Uh, the number of people living below the poverty level, uh, considering the economical capacities and nutrition diminished from 34% in the 50s to 30% in the year of 2008. The annual consumption of meat, the, the basic food for Mexico was eggs, uh, uh, corn, uh, frijoles. <laughs> now the actual consumption of meat per capita in the last 15 years grew from 74 pounds to 130. 36 pounds. The average schooling that uh, in, the, in the 50s was five years, uh, today is nine years, still, still very low. The number of uh, students in universities in, from 1950 to today has almost tripled. The average life expectancy, we already saw that, went uh, uh, from 58 years in 1960 to 75 years uh, in, in the year 2008. The vehicular traffic went from less than 4 million in 1980 to 20 million presently. This I don't think is a good idea if you go to, <laughs> to Mexico City. <laughs> Uh, credit uh, has tripled in the last six years. The number of users is close to 25 million. Passengers in the national flights exceeded 29 million. And uh, one uh, very important issue that cannot, that cannot be measured uh, some, uh, uh, with figures uh, is the dramatic advance in real democracy and freedom, freedom of speech. Mexicans, uh, we Mexicans are aware and conscious of the enormous problems that plague our country, but uh, we also know that there are enormous opportunities and a very promising future. Uh, many of us are seriously, seriously committed and working towards achieving a brighter f future. One of our most serious problems we already mentioned is poverty. 
partly as a, as a result of vicious circles such as the low quality and insufficient amount of education. I remember this morning, Rafael said that uh, the, the problem in Mexico City was education, and education and education, and we are absolutely convinced that this is something that we have to, to work. Many problems derive from the governance that historically has been more interested in maintaining their party's benefits than solving the problems. Okay, uh, at, the, at the beginning of my conversation, I should, have, I should have to tell you that they also asked me to speak a little about, about our group of inbound in the development, and, I, I, and I'll do that. I accepted to speak about that uh, in this important occasion because I'm I am deeply convinced that the characteristics of our group, and I have to say it with modesty, uh, could be important uh, enough to be taken in consideration by other members of the business community. BIMBO was fo founded in 1945, as I said, precisely at the end of the Second World War, and uh, we started with a small plant in Mexico City with 36 people, 10 trucks, and uh, four products, bakery products. Today, uh, Bimbo is, uh, is the largest uh, bakery in the world. We have more than 100 plants. We operate in 17 countries, and uh, we have more than 110,000 associates. Our sales figure this year should be close to 13 billion, uh, with the exception of China, where we uh, with the head of China, we have been there only for three years. Uh, we are number one in the countries in which we have presence, including the United States, Brazil, Argentina, Central America, and of course, Mexico. A few years ago, uh, when we were uh, presenting a, a case in Harvard, uh, our fir uh, friends in Harvard asked us what you Mexicans uh, can bring to a new country. Uh, what in particular do you think it's different or better uh, that will allow you to operate and frequently dominate other markets? And I think this, this was a very good question. We know that we do not have uh, better technology nor better equipment, uh, not secret formulas, not uh, better marketing skills, uh, superior to any other available to everybody around the world. But probably, probably we operate with better and average confidence based in our belief that we have some tenets that are extremely important and that probably many of our competitors do not have or do not believe as them, on them as firm as we do. I will mention very briefly some of these. We are a company that does not work only for profits. Profits are extremely important and are, they are indispensable if you, if you want to remain, if you want to grow, but we do not put profits in the first place. We put people in the first place. Uh, we believe that all persons have dreams, desires to participate, to grow, and to fully realize the, themselves, uh, their potential as, as human persons. They want to transcend, they want to leave a mark in this world, but the standard business system many times ignores that and they, they use the, the person. We strongly believe that if you respect the person and treat them with justice, with respect, with confidence, with affection, the person grows, the person cooperates, creates and feels himself or herself part of part of the group. And this is a very important principle and a strong element of our operational philosophy. I will not be able to bother you with all our tenets, but uh, mention one, integrity. We expect from all our associates to be honest, upright, trustworthy, and always act according to our integrity. We believe that integrity is and should remain um, our number one demand. To be acceptable in any activity, we must, we must start and comply with this policy in mind. 
You cannot trust a company or an institution or a person who, do, who does not fulfill this special this is, uh, requirement. To finalize, uh, let me mention you another principle that I consider relevant. We have a clear policy regarding growth. We have been grow growing steadily for the last 65 years, and we plan to, to do so all the time. We have a rule to reinvest 80% of our profits. Uh, we do not pay high dividends. Our stockholders uh, benefit for, from the growth of their stock. And uh, if you add to these uh, basic principles, the regular ones that the company should have, such as total quality, competitiveness, productivity, aggressive market, and so on, the result is that you have a company that will be uh, winning. I have to admit that this is not easy. Uh, different places in the world have different language. They have different culture, different economy, different tastes. And Sometimes you have to digest that at, at a very high cost. But uh, normally we have a, a positive response. I am to finish pleased to tell you how satisfied are our new associates in foreign countries when they realize that they will not be used, but rather integrated and become really part of the group. And when they verify th that them, that uh, their families is what really count. I want to finish. I know I'm late. I'm sorry very much. So I have to finish. And thank you very much, sir. Con mucho cariño that we're timing you. Con mucho cariño. We know that we know that all of you have come from far away to to give us your time. But I know people would like to ask you questions, and and I have one that I want to ask as well. Um, one of you mentioned a philanthropist in the earlier days as a man. Um, I, you described him. I'm not going to try to repeat exactly what you said. But now I see uh, entrepreneurs as Team Insight Access and the founder of Facebook, who are a much younger generation, and there was some women. Um, does that scare you? Does it empower you? What, what does it mean to you to see that? Maybe we can start with Manuel. Sería no, I think that's wonderful. I think that uh, that's exactly what we need. I mean, just like technology is used in business for many purposes, I think technology for the first time gives civil society the, the possibility to participate and strongly make their points and be part of the decisions. Before, it was very difficult for civil society. I mean, when I talk about civil society, I talk on anything from human rights to environment to everything. And uh, the social networks today, I mean, that's, that's, that's the name of the game. And I see that with enormous optimism because uh, this is silent voices of so many people doing other things beyond their rentability or beyond their pockets. People that really want to change the world for the better Sometimes they might be wrong or they might be too romantic, but I mean, I think the possibility of doing that is through technology. And uh, it's proven by the way what you said, what Facebook, I mean, I'm sure that the young man that invented uh, Facebook, I mean, he never was probably thought at the beginning that it would be a political network. And, you know, we see now what's going on in Egypt and uh, everybody's talking through Facebook and so on, like CNN in, in this time. So I'm all in favor. For me, it's just the best news that I have had in a long time. And I'm sorry that uh, it's beyond my time. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Senor Blanco. And please feel free to address the audience. You don't have to address me. Thank you. I don't have to add anything to what he said. No? <laughs> Seriously? Go ahead. Will it be mine? Well, I, I, this uh, uh, new technologies and so on, it doesn't scare me, but tells me that the world, that the society is entering a new world. As we had 200 years ago, the Industrial Revolution, now we have the Communication Revolution. And this is serious. <laughs> this is going to change completely what we are doing uh, for all of us that we are not so young, no more children. <laughs> but for, for the younger generation, this is, this is going to be a new world, completely different to what we had. 
<laughs> I don't know it better or worse, but different. Are you all on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a website? Yeah. Do your companies all have websites? Oh, yeah. Obviously. Okay. And you probably hire somebody to handle your social networking for your business, no? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's probably plenty of students that need a job. <laughs> I'm going to challenge each of you in a sentence to answer to whom or what do you attribute your own personal success in one sentence. Well, I don't know. I don't want to measure success, and least of all in my person. But uh, for me, success really is uh, feeling happy to be alive every day and having dreams to pursue. And at my age, which is quite late, I still have that. If you want to value that as success, uh, I think that's, that's, that's my way of looking at it. I, I don't think I can escape this one, huh? <laughs> well, success. Uh, I, I am a very lucky person uh, in the sense that I've been in the right place at the right time but well prepared. I mean, the, the fact that uh, President Salinas trusted me with the negotiation of NAFTA to do the day-to-day -day negotiations of NAFTA, it was one of the most uh, emotional, challenging, and rewarding jobs that I ever had. And um, so, um, and it was it was lucky in that sense. Why why me? Well, it's. Uh, being there at the right time, in the right place, and then uh, having done their homework before. Good advice. <laughs> Senor Roberto? Well, uh, success uh, to me is a, a very intimate feeling that you have when you are doing, not achieving, but doing what you have to do, even if you don't if you don't achieve what you want, but you, you are doing it. And you put your family in the first place. For me, uh, family life, it's extremely important before everything, after my God. And then when you serve, I believe that we are here to do something, to serve, not, not to serve ourselves, but to serve. And if you do your best serving, uh, whatever you do, brooming or whatever, uh, you are doing a good thing and you should be happy and I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I would like to open it up to questions because I know you probably have so many. This young lady right here in the middle, can you stand up? You have a book in your hand there. Uh, hi, my name is Minerva and my question, it could be the three of you. Uh, what are your opinions about the current investment on science and technology and the necessity to generate capacities and links between the government, the research centers, and the industrial sector, uh, and not just in the case of Mexico, to import technology? This is, this is uh, I, I am now a member of an organization where I never thought I would be a member of. It's called Science and Technology in Society. Uh, this, is, this is something done in Kyoto. And it's a group of, of highly technical, they're very high brow technical people. There are about 10 Nobel Prizes of, not economics, of course, medicine, physics, and they invited me. Uh, I, was, I was really humble, uh, but I, I went there and I gave a speech is this is this is speech was um, the one that has caused more diverse reactions. So this is a guy that doesn't know anything about science and technology. I give a speech, and I will answer your question. The reaction from people that were not from Mexico, they came and gave me very nice words. And just you got the uh, analysis very good. The Mexican delegation hated me. I mean, really hated me. <laughs> even, <laughs> even if I didn't, even I didn't speak about Mexico once. I didn't use the word. But what I said is, 
you know, investment in technology is, is very, very important. But it is something that when you are small, like Mexico, it's a very risky enterprise. If you invest $100 billion in technology, then you know, you probably five projects of those will come out right. If you invest $100 million, the probabilities that you don't get anything right are high. But I think that investment in technology in a country, for instance, like Mexico, has to be investment on the capacity to absorb technology, which is what you didn't like, and which is the, what the Mexican delegation didn't like. <laughs> but you know, the capacity to have people to absorb the technology very fast, that's what generates jobs, and that's what Mexico needs. It is beautiful what we do in, in uh, UNAM, in different universities, but you cannot trust on those projects as the source of growth. And you, will, you have beautiful things, beautiful contributions to humanity in, in many of the areas uh, of, of science in Mexico, but you cannot trust on those to build growth. You have to have the capacity to absorb the technology being generated in the rest of the world. They hated that when I said that. Senor Roberto, did you want to add something to that? No? Okay. A very good answer. This gentleman in the front row right here, question? Uh, hi, uh, my name is Marco Fernandez. I'm a fellow in the, in the Center for US-Mexican Studies. And uh, taking advantage that, that uh, especially, I mean, the three of you uh, work in in supporting projects uh, uh, in Mexico. I have a question regarding the comparison between the philanthropy in Mexico and the US. Because for a long time I have been thinking about this. Why is it the case that the business sector in Mexico seem to be not so involved as their counterparts in the US? Is it a matter of the fiscal incentives? a culture, or what is the reason of this big difference that seems to be in the behavior between the two business communities? Uh, you know, somebody informally asked me that question in the cocktail party last night. It was a young man. And uh, my answer was, well, it's a complex answer because it's composed of many pieces. But I, I'll tell you more or less what I have learned in the past. Well, let's go back to culture again. Once we did a study between uh, uh, foundation, American Foundation, I forgot if it was Ford Foundation or something, to compare precisely that, I mean. And then, if we go to culture, culturally in this country, I mean, in the United States, before you had government or something, you already had people getting organized. You had civil society getting organized. In Mexico, if we go back to pre-Hispanic, I mean, pre-Hispanic times, we were already told from the very beginning, I mean, somebody was organizing us, and somebody was telling us what to do. So I mean, it's, it's very difficult how, I mean, very different how the Mexican culture developed in that sense of the citizens getting organized to form a government, to create a government, the rule of law, property, private property, and so on and so forth. I think that's, that's the beginning of culture. Now, if we go back to, to present times, you know, uh, in my days as, a, as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, I was thought that basically if I did my job correctly, which was to pay taxes, to follow the labor laws and things, I was a very good businessman. I was an example to the community. This has changed, and that, that change came, basically at least I learned it from the United States many years ago. They started this business for social responsibility. They invited a lot of people from Latin America, and they told us, if you believe in that, take that culture. And we took that culture all over Latin America. And now business for social responsibility with the name of corporate responsibility or whatever is, uh, is accepted by all the, the, the important uh, and medium and small businessmen that you, your, your responsibility goes beyond being within the law and doing what you're supposed to do and paying the right dividends to, to your shareholders and so on. It goes beyond that. You have to be responsible on the ethics. You have to be responsible on the environment. You have to be responsible on your atmosphere, social work, etc. So I mean, this is a recent change. But I mean, I, I wanted to tell you the past, and this is the this is the present. It has been accepted. I think we see. A, you know, I, I finish with this. 
We there in the Mexican Center for Philanthropy to introduce social responsibility, corporate responsibility. And we decided to give an award, a yearly award to the corporations in Mexico that we think that, well, it was a big discussion in the board of Mexican Center for Philanthropy and said, who are we to judge the responsible company or not a responsible company? After a big debate, we decided to do it. And we gave 15 certificates about 15 years ago. The last time that we gave, we gave uh, the, the, the award, the yearly awards, would you have to gain it? I, I will not get into how to do it. We had more than 1,200 people in the room from all corporations that won the award and, uh, and they feel proud to have that award. So it's a change of mentality. It's a, a culture, like anything else, is the culture of philanthropy, the culture of giving, the culture of volunteer, the culture of social responsibility. It's a culture and it takes time to build it. I am so sad, but at this point we have to conclude our session here because we're running out of time. I would like to thank our panel so much for your time coming here to San Diego and to Insight, Team Insight Access, the students. I would like to very briefly introduce you to Laura Emilia Pacheco who has a few words to say. She's the Director of Publications for the National Council of Arts and Culture in Mexico, and she's representing the Secretary of Education in Mexico, Maestro Alonso Lujambrio. Laura Mitokaya. Thank you very much. I had written a lovely 20 minute speech, but now I'm down to five or less minutes, and I'll have to do that in Spanish. Please forgive me for doing so. Um, me siento muy honrada de haber estado aquí hoy en este simposio y les hago llegar un respetuoso saludo de parte de Alonso Lujambio, Secretario de Educación Pública. Felicidades a la Universidad de California en San Diego por estos primeros 50 años y muchos más de fructífera labor. Desde luego, muchas gracias a Marianne Fox, a Peter Cowie y a Alberto Díaz Calleros a la cónsul Remedios Gómez Arnau y a Pedro Cho, agregado cultural, y muchas, gracia, muchas gracias a Graciela Platero y a su staff por su ayuda. Y a todos y cada uno de los participantes, a Cristina Rivera Garza, a Rafael Tobari de Teresa, a Sebastián, a Diana Magaloni, a Mónica Patiño, a Roxana Velázquez, a Rodolfo Dirso, a Ezequiel Escurra, a Eduardo Santana y a Manuel Arango, Herminio Blanco y Roberto Servilje, que deben ser tres de los seres más ocupados del planeta y que supieron reconocer muy bien la importancia de este simposio y nos han regalado su tiempo y sobre todo su experiencia. Creo que ha sido fascinante escucharlos y que todos nos vamos muy estimulados por ello. Eh, hoy hemos tenido aquí cuatro sesiones, arte y cultura, museos y arte culinario, ciencia y el medio ambiente y filantropía. Todas ellas ha, nos han estimulado para desarrollar nuevas ideas que nos permitan trabajar en común. El camino está trazado y creo indispensable señalar la importancia de atender como se merece la relación entre Estados Unidos y México mediante estudios, publicaciones, proyectos y todas las iniciativas que nos acerquen en la búsqueda de un bien mutuo y común. Hemos establecido un diálogo, intercambiado puntos de vista y propuestas sobre aquello que hermana a dos grandes países como son Estados Unidos y México, cada uno con su personalidad propia, cada uno tan distinto y, sin embargo, con tantas similitudes. Como se dijo aquí muy acertadamente, no se trata de países distintos ni separados, sino de una sola civilización que responde a la enorme fuerza de la cultura occidental. Celebro inmensamente este simposio que espero sea el primero de muchos y muy fructíferos diálogos. Puedo decirles ya ahora que a partir de los encuentros de hoy ya se han delineado varios proyectos, lo que demuestra cuán fructíferas son iniciativas como esta. Aquí frente a ustedes han hablado hombres y mujeres, todos ellos mexicanos de excepción, de excelencia, por su trabajo, por sus logros, por la enorme pasión con la que se han comprometido a hacer de México un país mejor y para que los mexicanos seamos ciudadanos libres para decidir nuestro futuro. El panorama que ha emergido de estas charlas es uno de claroscuros, de fragilidad y potencial, de necesidad y riqueza. Escuchamos eh, eh, decir, y creo que es cierto, que la educación y la cultura y una cosa que dijo el señor Servitje, la lucha contra la impunidad, son las únicas fuerzas capaces de hacer confluir lo mejor de un pueblo y de combatir sus peores amenazas. 
Escuchamos con emoción al escultor, al escultor Sebastián contarnos de su proyecto en Ciudad Juárez, tristemente la ciudad más peligrosa del mundo, y de su afirmación de que nada lo detendrá en su arte. Actitudes como estas hay que aplaudirlas. Pero quiero contarles que su actitud valiente, decidida, es también la de muchos mexicanos que enfrentan la incertidumbre, prosiguiendo con su vida cotidiana, porque en México la vida sigue su flujo indetenible. Los mexicanos no estamos paralizados, como también lo mencionó el señor Arango. Espero que encuentros como este sirvan para derribar estereotipos para enfrentar la vida y conocer con los ojos bien abiertos, como diría la escritora Marguerite Dura, quiénes somos, qué queremos, cómo podemos convivir y construir un futuro de manera conjunta, porque en el mundo globalizado de hoy, lo que le ocurre a unos nos afecta a todos. Lo que nos afecta a nosotros tiene repercusiones en los demás, en una especie de efecto mariposa que puede ser maravilloso o devastador. Optemos siempre por el diálogo, por la crítica constructiva, por la unión de fuerzas y no por la separación de elementos. Finalmente, el mundo es uno solo y es de todos nosotros. La verdadera grandeza de los hombres, de las comunidades, de los países, puede medirse muy bien en la manera en que enfrentan sus problemas. Yo creo que juntos, together, we have what it takes to move forward. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Gracias, Laura. Gracias. I would like to thank everybody for being here, the audience. You've been a wonderful audience today. And congratulations to UCSD for your 50th anniversary. And thank you for being such a wonderful Oh, audience. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And to the, all of the presenters today, Um, thank you for your expertise, but most of all, thank you for your passion in moving Mexico forward. Thank you very much. Good night.